This is the 16th lecture and our topic for discussion today is double tuned circuits. Before we take up double tuned circuits, I would like to mention that in response to the challenges that I had set last time and I had said not all statements that I make are true. I am not under oath to make all true statements. I do make intentional mistakes and uh, one of the one of the things that has been pointed out is this relationship in a single tuned circuit if we take the output across a capacitor C and this is V i this is V 0 then the center frequency or the frequency of maximum I had claimed that this would be the geometric mean of the two cutoff frequencies omega C 1 and omega C 2 this happens to be a wrong statement. In fact, what is true is that omega m squared is equal to omega c 1 squared plus omega c 2 squared divided by 2. That is, it is the arithmetic mean of not of the half power frequencies, but of the, the square of the frequency of maximum response is the arithmetic mean of the squares of the half power frequencies. That is number one and number two I had set another challenge which has been very successfully met is how to get omega C 1. Omega C 2 we had found out uh, both the reports Mayank and uh, Manish both the reports I have got only two uh, have shown how to construct this omega C 1 geometrically and I am very happy very happy about it. May I also mention in passing that the statements that I had made is indeed true once again <laughs> with a pinch of salt is indeed true if you take the output across the resistor that is if the output voltage is proportional to the current in this circuit. Suppose I have a circuit like this then you can see from physical reasoning that at DC, at a DC the output shall be 0 because the capacitor will charge to the DC voltage. At infinite frequency the output shall again be 0. Why? Because the inductor offers an open circuit of J omega L omega goes to infinity therefore the impedance goes to infinity and therefore the response of this circuit shall truly be a band pass response it would be like this ok. It would start from 0 it would end up in 0 truly a, a band pass response and one can easily show that here omega m squared is indeed equal to omega c 1 times omega c 2 it is the geometric mean. Now you notice that the same circuit same tuned circuit can give you a low pass response and also a band pass response. A low pass response follows if you take the output across the capacitor and zeta is less than zeta is greater than or less than greater than 1 by root greater than the critical value all right. Similarly the same tuned circuit if you take the output across the inductor if you take the output across the inductor then you see that again from physical arguments at DC the output should be 0 because the inductor acts as a short circuit all right. At infinite frequency the output should be the same as the input that is the transfer function magnitude should be equal to 1 and therefore in between in between there may be there may be a maximum there may not be a maximum ok. For example, if zeta is less than a certain value I will get a response like this where the finite the, the final the infinite frequency value is unity starts from 0 at DC then it it may show a peaking ok depending on the value of zeta and then it goes uh, asymptotically to unity at infinite frequency. On the other hand 
if zeta is greater than a certain value that is if zeta exceeds the critical damping you might get a response like this which is truly a high pass response a high pass filter okay. So, the, the single tuned circuit is an extremely interesting circuit from which you can get high pass, low pass as well as band pass responses. You see even in the high pass mode it will act as a band pass if this goes high enough, if this is selective enough. Even in the low pass mode it can act as a band pass filter if the Q once again I go back to the definition of Q, Q is 1 by 2 zeta if Q is sufficiently high or zeta is sufficiently low all right. So, in any of the three modes the, the circuit can act as a bandpass filter provided the resistance in the circuit is not excessively large. It is this resistance which gives you the damping effect and therefore the resistance if the resistance is not excessively large it may act as a bandpass filter. But it may be of interest to find out in the high pass case, in the high pass mode, what is the frequency of maximum, what are the conditions for a peaking, what is the condition for critical damping, that is what is the condition for a, a, a transition between high pass and band pass, that is peaking or no peaking and how to find out the 3 dB cutoff okay it it is worth investigating. May I also mention that in the high pass mode it is very easy to see that the transfer function would be of the form S squared some constant k divided by S squared plus S squared plus twice zeta omega and S plus omega n squared. Do you see this that it will be S squared because this is S L divided by R plus S L plus 1 over S C, so it will be S squared. In the low pass mode the numerator was a constant, S square term was not there. In the band pass mode the numerator has a power of S. So, the, <coughs> the single tuned circuit is indeed a versatile circuit in which you can get K S to the power M divided by S square plus twice zeta omega N S plus omega N squared, a transfer function of this type where M can be either 0, 1 or 2, agreed? M equal to 0 is the low pass mode, M equal to 2 is the high pass mode and M equal to 1 is the band pass mode. All right, it is worth investigating all these three. <coughs> Now, we next consider the case of a pair, two pairs of complex conjugate roads. That is, we consider transfer functions in which there are two pairs of complex conjugate roots. For example, twice zeta 1 omega n 1 s plus omega n 1 squared and s squared plus twice zeta 2 omega n 2 s plus omega n 2 squared. We consider two pairs of complex conjugate roots. Okay. The numerator, the numerator may be a constant multiplied by some power of s. Obviously, the power m can it be negative? No, it cannot be negative. Okay. So, it is either 0, 1, 2, 3 or it can also be 4 okay depending on how you take the output okay let's see <coughs> and uh, a practical circuit which which gives this kind of a response is the so called double tuned circuit or a circuit which is magnetically coupled to each other the primary as well as the secondary both are tuned circuits that is two tuned circuits coupled to each other by means of their inductances, by means of a mutual inductance. We consider this circuit <coughs> this is my Vi function at Laplace transform voltage 
and then I have let us say an inductor and a resistor and this is my V0. So, it is a typical mode in which it is operated <coughs> and to keep life simple let us suppose that they are identical tuned circuits that is the resistance, capacitance, inductance are all identical <coughs> and that there is a mutual inductance between them let us say these are the dots there is a mutual inductance which is equal to as you know square root of L1 L2 k times square root of L1 L2 so this would be k times L all right and k is the coefficient of coupling k lies between 0 and 1. <coughs> we shall investigate this circuit it is one example of producing one example of a circuit which produces two pairs of complex conjugate poles and we shall see <coughs> we shall see how this simple circuit can behave in a wide variety of manners to be able to uh, <coughs> to be able to uh, analyze this let's suppose let's consider two loop currents i1 and i2 okay you notice that m is the dots are in the favorable direction but I have reversed the direction of current and therefore the mutual inductance term shall come with a negative sign is this clear okay so my equation shall be vi would be equal to r plus 1 over sc plus sl multiplied by i1 this is the self impedance term my <coughs> primary equation becomes R plus 1 over SC plus SL times I1 and then the mutual inductance terms as I said it should come with a negative sign SM I2 and for the second loop that is for the secondary 0 would be equal to minus SM I1 plus R plus SL plus 1 over SC times I2 these are the two loop equations and my transfer function h of s is equal to v0 by vi v0 is i2r the current i2 flowing through the resistance r divided by vi and from the second equation from equation number 2 you can see if i i would like to put some sub, some abbreviations let's call this z and this one as z then obviously you notice from the second equation that I2 equal to SM by Z times I1 agreed agreed from the second equation I2 equal to SM by Z times I1 and if I substitute this in the expression for transfer function I get H of S equals to SM by Z times I1 times R i2 r divided by v i which is z i1 minus s m times i2 so it will be s squared m squared by z times i1 and you can now cancel i1 and get this as s m r divided by z squared and multiply by z also minus s squared m squared all right now let us simplify <coughs> z squared z squared is r plus sl plus 1 over sc whole squared which i can write as s squared c squared all right and then s squared lc plus S C R plus one whole squared, and this I can write as if I take L C out, then I shall get L squared by S squared. Is that okay? This C square shall cancel with if I take L C out, 
it will come as L squared C squared, C squared C squared cancel multiplied by S squared plus S R by L plus 1 over L C whole squared. Agreed? Now, <coughs> I introduce the notations. Let me write this equation again H of S equal to S M R divided by Z squared minus S squared M squared and I have found, found out Z squared as equal to L squared by S squared S squared plus <coughs> now R by L if you recall I represent this as twice zeta omega n in terms of zeta the damping factor and omega n the natural undamped natural frequency. So, I get twice zeta omega n s and I also make 1 by L c as omega n squared therefore, I get omega n squared all right. Therefore, my h of s the transfer function becomes s m r divided by L squared it would be a whole square thank you L squared the S squared that occurs here I can take it in the numerator as S cubed all right then in the subtraction minus S squared M squared I must have S to the fourth M squared okay all right this S squared I am taking I am multiplying both numerator and denominator by S squared. So, this becomes S to the fourth M squared and here I shall have S squared plus twice zeta omega n S plus omega n squared a bit of algebra not too difficult though. I can simplify this further by <coughs> by putting m equal to k l have I missed a term no uh, what I will do is ok if I if I write this again h of s as equal to s cubed m r I divide by l square both numerator and denominator then in the denominator this becomes s squared plus twice zeta omega n s plus omega n squared whole squared minus I divide by l squared. So, I get s to the fourth time k squared simply because m is equal to k times l all right ok. So, <coughs> what is m r divided by L squared the M is K L and therefore, it is K R divided by L agreed and what is R by L twice omega n. n and therefore, I get twice zeta omega n times K all right this quantity becomes twice zeta omega n K therefore, my right H of S as equal to twice zeta omega n K multiplied by s cubed divided by s squared plus twice zeta omega n s plus omega n squared whole squared minus s squared k whole square all right. No simplification no no approximation so far it is exact all right. Now, the denominator you can see it is of the form s squared minus b squared and therefore, you should be able to take factorize into a plus b and a minus b and the result is the following I get h of s as equal to twice zeta omega n k s cubed divided by s squared if I add the two terms a plus b then I get 1 plus k plus twice zeta omega n s plus omega n squared and the second factor would be the same except for a change of sign of k that is I shall get s squared 1 minus k plus twice zeta omega n s plus omega n squared. 
let us do a little more simplification let us take 1 plus k out from here and 1 minus k out from here then I get twice zeta omega n k divided by 1 minus k squared multiplied by s cubed do you understand what I am doing 1 plus k I have taken out and 1 minus k I have taken out. So, the product is 1 minus k square that is what happens that is what appears here and the factors that will be left would be s squared plus twice zeta omega n divided by 1 plus k s plus omega n square this is one of the factors multiplied by this 1 plus k yes I must not miss that multiplied by s squared plus twice zeta omega n divided by 1 minus k s plus omega n squared divided by 1 minus k ok. Now we have we have the expression in the form of a constant a a constant a multiplied by s cubed therefore there are 3 zeros at the origin three zeros at the origin because of s cubed in the denominator I have two quadratic factors and each quadratic factor shall have two roots and therefore I have four poles and as you know if the poles are on the real axis the case is of very little interest real axis poles do not offer selectivity it the case would be of interest and our our <coughs> uh, trouble of introducing four energy storage elements two inductors two capacitors in fact five energy the mutual inductance also stores energy five uh, energy storage elements would be successful provided the poles are complex conjugate ok. This is a real polynomial real polynomial so the poles shall be complex conjugate. Now, assuming that the poles are complex conjugate I can write my h of s as equal to a s cubed divided by s minus s 1 multiplied by s minus s 1 star ok s 1 and s 1 star are the roots of the first polynomial then s minus s 2 s minus s 2 star to understand to to understand the approximations that we shall be using a little later let us look at s 1 and s 1 star. Now, s 1 s 1 star are the roots of the equation s squared plus twice zeta omega n divided by 1 plus k s plus omega n squared divided by 1 plus k equal to 0 agree. Therefore, s 1 s 1 star would be equal to minus 2 zeta omega n divided by 1 plus k plus minus j all right square root of yes which term shall we have first by 1 plus k 4 times this omega n square divided by 1 plus k minus now 4 times this 4 zeta squared omega n square divided by 1 plus k whole square agreed divided by 2 you must not forget that. Now this 2 can be cancelled out 2 with this 2 this 4 and this 4 all right. So I get equal to minus zeta omega n divided by 1 plus k plus minus j I can take omega n out omega n from omega n squared I can take this out square root of 1 by 1 plus k minus zeta square divided by 1 plus k whole squared agreed. I have not made any approximation so far. I have only made simplification and I made the assumption that the poles are complex. If they are not complex then you see zeta must be greater than the critical value 
there shall be no peaking, even if there is peaking it shall be horrible, the Q shall be large. Q is 1 by 2 zeta, I am sorry, Q shall be small and therefore the circuit shall offer no selectivity. It is only for the purpose of selectivity that we take the trouble of combining uh, energy storage elements of different kinds. Okay. Similarly, if you let me write this again S1, S1 star is equal to minus zeta omega n divided by 1 plus k plus minus j omega n square root of 1 by 1 plus k minus zeta squared divided by 1 plus k whole square. Similarly, I can write S2, S2 star the only change will be k shall be replaced by minus k that is all. So, minus zeta omega n divided by 1 minus k plus minus j omega n square root of 1 by 1 minus k minus zeta square divided by 1 minus k whole square. I now make some approximations. I now argue that a circuit of this complexity where there are two coils which have been brought close to each other magnetically coupled there are there are capacitances in both these circuits which shall be useful only if it is a high Q situation that is if individually the tuned circuit there are two tuned circuits identical tuned circuits we assume for simplicity the tuned circuits themselves must be high Q that is zeta must be small. We do assume that zeta squared is much less compared to unity. We assume that zeta squared is much less compared to unity and we also assume that the couple that the coils are loosely coupled that is we also assume that k is much less than unity they are loosely coupled. Okay? If that is the case then I can ignore this k let me indicate the simplifications. I will ignore this k and this k in the denominator. I will take them out. I will ignore this term as compared to 1 by 1 plus k. 1 by 1 plus k would be slightly less than unity, but because of zeta squared here, this would be very small compared to the first term. So, I will ignore these two terms also. In addition, I will make the simplification that 1 by square root of 1 plus k is equal to 1 plus k to the power minus half approximately equal to 1 minus k by 2. Okay? Mind you the simplifications are based on the assumption of high Q circuits that is low resistance capital R must be low number 1. Number two is that the coils are not too critically coupled, too uh, tightly coupled, they are loosely coupled. If that is so, then you notice that S1, S1 star becomes a very simple expression. It simply becomes minus zeta omega n plus minus j omega n 1 minus k by 2. All right? And similarly, S2, S2 star that becomes minus zeta omega n plus minus j omega n. The only thing that happens is k changes its sign, so 1 plus k by 2. And the situation with this approximation, the location of the roots, the location of the roots, you see that they occur there is a quad of roots, quad, four of them, all right. And the real parts of all the roots are the same, okay. That is, all the poles lie on a line parallel to the j omega axis. The real part is the same, minus zeta omega n in the left half plane. However, on this line, which is parallel to the j omega axis, there are two in the upper quadrant and two in the lower quadrant two in the second quadrant and two in the third quadrant and the two in the second quadrant are symmetrical with respect to omega n. Isn't that right? One is j omega n 1 minus k by 2, the other is j omega n 1 plus k by 2 and the other one is negative that is in the third quadrant. So, the situation is like this. Let 
let me explain. These are the three zeros at the origin and we, we indicate this by three concentric circles okay three zeros. There are four poles with this approximation this is one this is one this is one this is one two in the third quadrant two in the second quadrant and two in the third quadrant okay. The real part is minus zeta omega n for all of them. So, this root is minus zeta omega n plus j omega n 1 minus k by 2. So, this is this is omega n this is omega n you see at a distance of zeta omega n. So, it is halfway below omega n. So, this distance is omega n k the distance between the two poles is that clear? No. Shall we go back to this? You see what I am saying is S1 S1 is let us say minus zeta omega n plus j omega n 1 minus k by 2 and S2 is minus zeta omega n plus j omega n 1 plus k by 2. So, what is S1 minus S2? It is simply or S2 minus S1 okay S2 minus S1 okay it is simply j omega n k all right. So, the difference between the two poles the difference between the two poles is simply the distance is omega n k and it is on the j omega axis so j omega n k this distance is omega n k and you see the simplification that it achieves is that the two poles in the upper quadrant become symmetrical about the natural undamped natural frequency of the tuned circuits about omega n. Similarly, similarly these two in the lower quadrant I am going to make further simplifications. So, it is it is essential that you understand this simplification and the only things that you have assumed is that zeta is much less than 1 and k is much less than 1 actually zeta square. You see zeta it is it is very easy to satisfy zeta squared much less than 1 because if zeta is let us say 0 0.5 zeta squared is 0 0.25 if zeta is 0 0.1 zeta squared is 0 0.01 all right 100 okay. So, under this condition the poles and zeros of the double tuned circuit assume this particular form all right. Now, here we are going to make further simplifications further simplifications like this suppose I want to find out the magnitude response at this frequency omega n. Then as you know as you know my <coughs> transfer function is a s cubed divided by s minus s 1 s minus s 1 star s minus s 2 s minus s 2 star ok. Therefore, h of j omega would be equal to a j omega cubed divided by j omega minus s 1 j omega minus s 1 star j omega minus s 2 multiplied by j omega minus s 2 star ok. And as far as magnitude is concerned all we do is we draw a vector from the point j omega to the zeros and to the poles we draw the vectors these are the vectors from the poles from the pole to the point at which you want to find out the magnitude response from these two poles to the point m1 m2 m3 m4 these are the magnitudes of these vectors and m0 is the vector drawn from the origin to from the zeros to omega n and therefore my h of j omega n h of j omega n under this condition shall be a m0 cubed 3 zeros divided by m1 m2 m3 m4 all right the magnitude I can also find the phase from this diagram all right let us concentrate on the magnitude at the moment. Any question? 
m0 cubed comes from j omega cubed m0 is this vector from the 0 to omega n it is the 0 vector and since it occurs 3 times we are taking m0 cubed okay. Now I want you to look at this diagram very carefully <coughs> you see when omega when our frequency this is the situation at omega n now when our frequency is around omega n what does it mean a narrow band centered around the undamped natural frequency then m0 even if omega shifts a little on the upper side or lower side m0 can be approximated as omega n agreed okay when omega let me write this again I will come back to this diagram again and again so h of j omega omega around omega n this is what this is how I indicate it omega around omega n h of j omega which is equal to a m0 cubed m0 is now a function of omega divided by m1 m2 m3 m4 okay when omega is around omega n m0 can be approximated by omega n agreed when the frequency is close to omega n when the frequency is around this point it can be approximated by omega n not only that if zeta is low this figure is an exaggerated figure if zeta is low the lines j omega axis and this line are very close to each other if they are close to each other if they are close to each other naturally m3 and m4 should also be close to each other this poles you see k is a small quantity it is a loose coupling and therefore these poles are also very close to each other which means that when frequency is around omega n both m3 and m4 can be taken to be approximately equal and approximately equal to twice m0 is that clear so I do this approximation m3 and m4 both are approximately equal to twice omega n if I do that then h of j omega becomes equal to magnitude becomes equal to a omega n cubed divided by m1 m2 4 omega n squared that is equal to a omega n divided by 4 divided by m1 m2 I hope you realize what I have done No. Sir, otherwise what would happen that m3 and m4 will not be equal to 2 m0, 2 omega n. Why not? <laughs> you see this line, this line is very close. Just a minute. I understand your, your confusion. You see first we say because k is small, omega n is not necessarily small because k is small these two poles are very close to each other so m3 and m4 are approximately equal then I argue that these two lines are very close to each other but this is zeta times omega n which is zeta times oh, correct zeta is a small quantity and therefore they are very close to each other therefore m3 and m4 are approximately twice m0 okay this is an approximation and a fairly good approximation in practice as far as design of the circuit is concerned. So that means sir, we have approximated that S2 star and S1 star equal to J omega. Both the quite poles, so, quite both so. the poles are at J omega. Quite so. That is correct. And therefore, if you notice carefully, what we have done is this is a constant, let us call it a K. And therefore, for the double tuned circuit for the double tuned circuit with omega approximately equal to omega n around omega n the magnitude function 
has been approximated as k by m1 m2 which physically means I go back to this diagram which physically means that it is these two poles which are close to omega approximately equal to omega n affect the magnitude response much more than the zeros and the other two poles. This is all that I have expressed in terms of this mathematical approximation which is obviously true if omega shifts a little bit m1 and m2 the relative change in m1 and m2 are much greater than the relative change in m3, m4 or m0. This is what I have done. No, I have done something else. If you recall the single tuned circuit, in the single tuned circuit we had two poles like this and we had expressed the magnitude response as k sin psi over m1 m2 or oh, it was simply k sin psi because m1 and m2 are included but there also the magnitude response if this is omega if this is j omega and this is m1 and this is m2 the magnitude response is simply a constant divided by m1 m2 and therefore virtually the double tuned circuit has been converted to a single tuned circuit with one difference in the single tuned circuit this was 0 and therefore what we have done is we have raised the origin or the germ or the real axis we have raised it by an amount omega n and therefore the total the response of the double tuned circuit at frequencies around omega n which are our concern will be basically determined exactly in the same manner as that of a single tuned <coughs> circuit. In other words, I can now bring in the concepts of the peaking circle. Okay? The peaking circle for example would be a circle, what would be the center? So omega. This would be the center and this as the radius, you draw a circle. If it cuts the j omega axis, then there shall be peaking. If it does not cut the geomega axis, then there shall be no peaking. That is not correct. <laughs> Unfortunately, there shall be peaking. You see, this is not zero. Omega, this is not zero. This is omega n. So, what you said about raising the? Oh, raising. You see, in this in the single tuned circuit, this center was zero. Yeah. Was the origin of the complex plane. Whereas the center here is omega n. So it is as if the real axis has been raised by a level, has been transformed to omega n. Alright? Once that is established, once that is established, then this behaves exactly like a single tuned circuit. However, however, whether whether the peaking circle cuts the j omega axis or does not cut the j omega axis, it does not matter, there shall still be a peaking and this can be understood with reference to another diagram which we shall project next time. It is 201, so we continue on Thursday.